Probably the most common uh, bipolar transistor amplifier is the common emitter amplifier operating in class A. So today's video we're going to talk about some design tips and shortcuts for class A common emitter amps. When designing an amplifier you usually have some goals and constraints. You know the most common of course would be how much gain do you want the amplifier to produce. Uh, that will certainly enter into the design process but other things will as well in terms of what kind of input impedance do you need to have, what kind of output impedance do you need to have, or what kind of load are you going to drive, how much power supply voltage do you have available to you, and how much power dissipation you know, do you want this circuit to draw. All of these things will have an impact on how you do your design. Now uh, before I get started here I also want to mention that there's a couple of related videos here that might be helpful for you uh, along with this video number 185 that talks about uh, transistor bias circuits and dependence on current gain or beta of the transistor and how to minimize that dependence really helpful video here we'll talk about uh, the implications of that next number 113 and 14 talk a little bit about uh, the transistor bias point and class of operation as I mentioned we're going to be talking about a class A amplifier here today and also the, uh, the common emitter, common base, and common collector amplifier uh, just configurations Again, we're talking about the common emitter one today. And then video number 67 that uh, also goes through some uh, common emitter amp gain and frequency response calculations. They might be good, good follow-ups. And I'll put links to each of these videos down in the video description below. I've got a little common emitter amplifier built up on my breadboard here. Let's take a look at the test circuit we'll be using to look at both the DC bias conditions as well as uh, how to configure the gain. So here's our common emitter amplifier. A couple of bias resistors, 33K and 3.3K, emitter resistor of 1.2. The collector resistor I'm going to vary with a couple of experiments, so we'll leave that one just labeled R3 for now. A 47 microfarad uh, bypass cap for the emitter that we'll put in optionally later on for some of the experiments. And then I'm AC coupling in through a 2.2 microfarad cap. Now to generate the signal when we do some of the gain calculations, I'm using a, a sine wave a function generator. Uh, running at 50 millivolts peak to peak uh, with a, uh, at a 10 kilohertz frequency. I've got that running out uh, to a BNC T located right at uh, scope channel 2 with a high impedance termination. We can see that uh, right here. And then coming out of there I'm going to go into a 10x attenuator or a 20 dB attenuator and that's uh, located right here. That's followed up with a 50 ohm terminator. The 50 ohm terminator is going to do two things. It properly terminates the line which at this frequency we don't really care about but what it also does is ensures that the 10x attenuator sees the load it's intended to see so it really is a 10x attenuator and then I just follow that with a little BNC to alligator clip adapter to bring the signal into my test circuit. Now you might ask why am I doing uh, this 10x attenuator well I want to drive this signal uh, drive this amplifier with a very low level signal in this case just 5 millivolts peak to peak now if I probe that directly with the scope, uh, the trace on the scope would be pretty noisy because you get 5 millivolts peak to peak. It's a, you want to probably set the scope to you know, 1 or 2 millivolts uh, per division and uh, things get just pretty noisy there. So what I'm doing is I'm going to drive, you know, drive that signal into the scope at a higher level and then just adjust the attenuation factor on the scope to 0.1x which is 1 over that. So the scope will still read the voltage that's being applied but the actual voltage that's actually going in the scope is 10 times higher. Just a little bit of a trick to be able to get a nice clean uh, low level signal uh, or represent, representation of a low level signal that we're going to apply to the input. So that's going into channel 2. Channel 1 I'm probing with a 10x scope probe at the collector, at our output of the amplifier. So with these two we'll be able to look at the input and output of the amplifier and calculate its gain. Now the first consideration is always the DC bias condition for the amplifier. Uh, for a bipolar transistor it's always a good idea to design the bias circuit so that you have a few hundred millivolts across a degeneration or emitter resistor. And the reason for that is it gives you good bias stability versus beta variation. As you know current gain or beta of a transistor is uh, pretty unpredictable or a given transistor that can vary pretty wildly. So by designing the bias circuit to be independent of beta, you'll get a very consistent operation of the amplifier for different transistors that you might swap in or if you want to replicate the amplifier again. Again, video number 185 covers that in good detail.
Now you'll get that couple of hundred millivolts across the emitter by properly setting up the base voltage. And that's typically done with a resistor divider uh, at the input. Now uh, if we're going to have a few hundred millivolts here, we're going to have six or seven tenths of a volt above that sitting at the base. So typically, you know, one to one and a half volts or so sitting at the base will give you a good amount of de degeneration voltage and good bias stability for the amplifier. Now the values of the resistors will often be driven by the currents that we need to drive in the bias string and through the collector. And oftentimes that's going to be driven by one or two requirements. Usually it's driven by what does the output impedance have to be. Uh, for low power circuits this might be a relatively large value resistor. That means we're going to be running some lighter currents through here so all the resistors will be high. Or if we're driving a low impedance load, uh, the collector resistor might have to be low as well so that we don't get too much gain reduction when we hook up to the next stage. So your application is really going to drive what this approximate value is going to be for your collector resistor. So once you've got that kind of narrowed down a little bit, the next thing to decide is what bias voltage we want to sit at the collector. Now if you want to uh, design the amplifier to have a large output swing, you need to give the uh, amplifier enough headroom to drive the positive and negative peaks of your signal. Therefore, this bias voltage should be sitting somewhere between midway between VCC and either the base or emitter voltage. Uh, if you do a midway between the base and emitter voltage, that will give you the maximum swing, but just keep in mind, if you drive that collector voltage too far down towards the emitter, you'll get close to saturation and you're also going to increase distortion. So a good idea is maybe pick a, an operating point or quiescent point that's midway between VCC and the base voltage. That will give you a lot of room for swing and start to get away from that area where you might get some additional distortion or run the risk of uh, saturating the transistor. Now an interesting little trick I'm going to show you later is that uh, oftentimes the voltage you drop across this resistor is going to directly determine how much gain you have. But uh, stay tuned for that. That's kind of a cool little trick. So once we know our approximate value for R3 and where we want it biased, that kind of tells us what our collector current is going to be. If we know what our collector current is going to be, we know that the emitter current is virtually the same as that. So if we want a couple of hundred millivolts across this, we can then use Ohm's law to calculate uh, about what that resistor value needs to be. So now with the collector resistor and the emitter resistor uh, calculated, what do we do about our resistor bias string? Now it's a good idea to make this bias string also independent of beta. So what that means is we want the base current that's going to be coming down through R1 and into the base, we want that base current to be pretty small with respect to the current flowing through the string. And a good rule of thumb is to make the current flowing through the string at least 10 times greater than the base current. Now a couple of uh, little tricks here as well. Since the beta of many bipolar transistors is on the order of about 100, uh, we just know that we want this current here to be about uh, one-tenth of the current going in the collector. That will ensure that we've got at least 10 times the base current flowing through the string, and therefore any variations in base current is not going to make a big change in the bias voltage here. Of course you could make the current in this bias string much, much larger than the base current. But then you go start thinking about how much power do I want to burn just in setting up this bias. If the circuit is designed to go into, say, a low power uh, application, like a battery powered application, you might not want to burn a lot of extra current going through these resistors unnecessarily. So usually the choice of these resistors and the choice of this current is a trade-off between bias stability and power dissipation in the amplifier. Let's take a look at how I've got our test circuit biased. So if we take a look across the 1.2K emitter resistor, I've got about uh, 509 millivolts there. That puts the base uh, at about uh, 1.09 volts and uh, puts the collector, uh, in this case, at 9.93 volts. I've got a 4.7K ohm resistor uh, in the collector here. We're going to change that out for a different value later on. So this bias might seem a little high based on the recommendation I made earlier, but I'm not necessarily looking for maximum signal swing here. I'm just going to do some experiments to talk about gain in a little bit. There's two configurations we'll talk about for gain calculations. One with emitter degeneration, where the emitter resistor does not have a bypass cap, and one where we do, the emitter is bypassed. This, and now the difference is that the emitter bypass calculation is going to give you higher gain, but also generally higher distortion. 
the uh, without the bypass uh, capacitor. We're generally talking about lower gain applications, but uh, very precisely controlled gain and uh, some pretty low distortion as well. Now, as long as we have several hundred millivolts across the emitter resistor, the voltage gain of this configuration is actually quite simply given by you know minus RC over RE, that resistor value divided by that resistor value. So very easily determine the gain just by a ratio of two resistors. This is because with that couple hundred millivolts here, the contribution of the incremental emitter resistance for RE, or one over the transconductance, is negligible. So it kind of drops out of the equation. And, and I say this is approximate because there will be some small error, but uh, generally well within you know just a couple of percent. Now in our case, the collector resistor is uh, 4.7k ohms, and our emitter resistor is 1.2k ohms. So take that ratio. It says our gain should be about 3.9. So let's take a look and see what that is. Now on the scope, I've got uh, two different waveforms. The blue waveform is actually channel 2 and that's on a 1 millivolt per division scale. So that shows us our 5 millivolt peak-to-peak -peak, uh, input signal. Uh, the yellow trace is channel 1, that's our output at the collector, and that's on a 10 millivolt per division scale. Now I'm actually using uh, the scope uh, math capability to actually calculate the gain for me to make my life a little bit easier. Let's take a look at that. The scope is measuring the amplitude of the output voltage, about 20 millivolts peak to peak, and the input voltage, just a little over 5 millivolts peak to peak. So I could just do the math on that, but why not? Let me let the, have the scope do it for me. So I've set up a math function uh, to have the amplitude of the output divided by the amplitude of the input. That gives me a math trace, this red trace, which is essentially equal to the gain. So I just set up one more measurement to measure the mean of that math. And we can see that's showing me that same 3.9 volts per volt that we calculated that this gain ought to be. So now let's swap out the 4.7k resistor for a 20k ohm resistor. And if we do take a look at that and calculate what that gain ought to be, so if we have a 20k divided by 1.2, that gives us a gain of about 16.7. And we take a look at the scope, and this is showing our gain of about 15.2. Certainly well within just a few percent of the 16.7 that we calculated. And again, that was using nominal values for these resistors, and there's some tolerance there we didn't take into account. So that's certainly close enough. Therefore, we can see that for the case of emitter degeneration, the voltage gain is pretty closely predicted by simply the resistor vet ratio of the collector resistor to the emitter resistor minus RE, RC over RE. As I mentioned, this configuration is really good for relatively low gain applications. because It's tough to get a lot of gain when your gain is controlled by this uh, resistor ratio, and we've got already a couple of hundred millivolts tied up across that resistor. So for high gain applications, you typically will bypass uh, the emitter resistor. And this will give us higher gain, a little more distortion, but can get some pretty reasonable gain out of the circuit. Now what's really cool is that the gain calculation, while it can be complex, can boil down to a very simple approximation here, where the voltage gain is simply equal to the voltage across the collector resistor divided by this parameter called VT, or thermal voltage. All you have to remember is that VT is 26 millivolts at room temperature for bi uh, silicon bipolar transistors. So uh, it doesn't vary too much with temperature because it's proportional to absolute temperature. So uh, even uh, around normal operating conditions, 26 millivolts is a good approximation. And this will give you, predict the gain, to within about 10% for small signals, where I would define small signals with uh, the input voltage or the variation of base emitter about 10 millivolts or so. And that's the condition that we're playing with here. So let's actually go verify that. Pretty cool simplification. All right, so I put uh, my 4.7K collector resistor back in here again. I'm going to shut off the uh, signal generator and measure the voltage directly across that collector resistor. So we're seeing about 2.051 volts. So let's calculate out what that gain should be. So we have uh, 2.051 and we'll divide that by 0.026 or 26 millivolts and it gives us a gain of about 78, 78.8. Let's go see what the scope tells us. And we'll turn the signal generator back on and let's insert the uh, bypass capacitor around the emitter resistor. 
I'll oh, readjust the scope because we got much higher gain here now. And let's go zoom in and see what the scope is telling us for the gain calculation. We said the gain was going to be about 78, and we're seeing about 75. And again, this is an approximation, it's going to get you to within about 10%, and we're well within 10% for that calculation. Let's do the same thing for a 20K load resistor. So we'll swap out the 4.7 uh, for 20K. And we can see that uh, the signal's gotten a lot larger here again. Now let's uh, go first and measure uh, what that voltage drop is across that 20K resistor. And it looks like we're sitting at uh, about 8.25 volts. Let's calculate out what that gain ought to be. So if we say 8.25 divided by 26 millivolts, and we should see a gain of about 317. And let's see what the scope is telling us here. And there we go. So um, 295 or so. So that's uh, just about 10% uh, low, which is, again, uh, about what we expect. Uh, we're only going to be within about 10% with that approximation. But that is a pretty cool approximation for, for gain and a very simple calculation. Uh, just measure or you know, figure out the voltage across my collector resistor divided by 26 millivolts and that gives you the gain. Pretty cool. So where does this approximation come from? Well, uh, let's start with uh, kind of the ebers mole approximate gain equation for small signal uh, common emitter amplifiers where the voltage gain is given by you know, minus the transconductance times the collector resistance. The transconductance GM is simply equal to the collector current divided by VT, our friend the thermal voltage, 26 millivolts. Uh, now also we've got this parameter called RE, the incremental emitter resistance. Incremental emitter resistance is just 1 over GM or VT divided by IC. And if we take a look at it then this gain equation is basically the same thing as saying AV is equal to RC over RE. Gee, that looks awful familiar, right? That's the same gain equation we used right here. So really it's the same gain equation, just represented differently. We talk about it in terms of GM. But now if we actually just do some substitution of things here and say, well, if the gain was you know, GM times RC, the GM is IC divided by VT. So if we kind of expand this out and say 1 over VT times the product of IC times RC. Uh, we can then say that uh, IC times RC is just the voltage drop across the collector resistor. So uh, we just put that here and voila, AV is equal to, you know, the minus sign belongs in front of all of these things here, of course. Okay, but the AV is equal to the voltage across the collector resistor divided by VT. Just a really cool simplification. So I hope this video has given you a little bit of insight into some of the shortcuts and, of gain calculation and some of the uh, tips and tricks in terms of setting up uh, the bias conditions for a common emitter uh, Class A amplifier. Uh, if you like the video, please give me a thumbs up. If you have any comments or questions, please uh, you know, list them down below. I'll try to get to them. And uh, thanks again for watching. We'll see you next time.